show of hands, how many of you either own a business or have owned a business, no matter how big or small? Wow, wow, okay. You understand the, the passion that's involved in the need and want for success. It was 1995, my best friend and I joined forces to start a new company. We had a brilliant idea. We went and partnered with another gentleman who could fund us, provide us with programming. We were certain, we were positive. We know for sure that we were gonna be multimillionaires. This was the best idea in the world. I mean, it was as sure as, sure as Darren is with lack of hair. <laughs> there you go. And it was going well. And then it happened. It happened. One day we found out that our business partner was not only using us for free work for his company, but he was siphoning the money off and taking money from our company. I was mad. No, I was pissed. I needed justice. I was devastated. My dreams were violated. You know what he did to me? Do you know how bad it was? You know what he did to my family? Surely we can have justice and find a way to make this right. So I went out of my way and we found a way in order to get controlling on the stock. It took months. Oh, it took months, but it took a while. We got justice to the point where I got to watch him have to move out of his company. I can remember that day I was sitting in my office inside at my desk with my feet up and smoking a cigar inside of the office while he was packing up. Oh, I got him and I got him good and it felt great. And then he found a way find his justice. And so he went out and bought, bought the rest of the stock on the other side of the siding factor. And guess who found his way outside of the office? And went on like this for the next year to the point where after $80,000 in legal fees, I have knows how much heartache. We won, but there was nothing left. The company was bankrupt. And for the next 20 years, felt that anger inside that surely, surely God will make this right. Because what he did to me, to my family, and I thought about him all the time. I would look him up on the internet. And surely something bad will happen to him so that there will be justice. All things work for good for those who love the Lord. If you ever had dreams of a bright future of that you know how it's going to work out in your family, your relationship, and then, and then it happened. Maybe it's your own business story. You got fired for no reason at all. A drunk driver caused a really bad accident in your life because somebody that you love and lost their life. A doctor misdiagnosed you. Uh, an uncle who did some really, really bad things to you as a child. A significant other who betrayed you, you betrayed them. A friend whom you trusted would hurt you just when you needed it most. A pastor at church that turned out to be a fraud. A parent or a loved one is a child. I mean, how many of us have dad issues? Or are the dad issues? Uh, Author of The Shack, if you're familiar with him, Paul Young, said that it took him 50 years, 50 years to get the face of his dad off of the face of Jesus because of his dad issues. One out of four women and one out of six men, one out of four women and one out of six men have been sexually abused and they're alive. Look around in this room, one out of six men. One, think about the, the six, 12, 18, 24 men that you know in your life. How many of them have spoke up about this? It's a broken world full of pain, shame, and blame. Now, I don't know your story. 
But I know each one of you are holding on to some kind of pain story in your life. And you feel it. You feel it with every being in your body. We don't make it through adulthood without this, let alone through childhood without emotional scars, bumps, and bruises. I don't know your story, but I do know that it's real. And for you, it hurts. And you're holding on to that. And that pain that you're carrying around with you consumes you from time to time, shows up in different ways of anger and resentment. So I'm here today to talk to you about forgiveness. But please, let's start off with being honest with this. Who really wants to forgive? Who wants to forgive? Think about what they did to you. Who wants to forgive? They don't deserve it, and they never will. Justice. See, the reality of the Bible itself and in life is there's really two paths, two choices, two opportunities that we have to do with this. There's the path of justice, and there's the path of mercy. Now, they're tied together. Justice and mercy are tied together just as, as much as they contrast each other. Kind of like two sides of the same thing. One side we have justice, and the other side we have mercy. We have judgment, and we have grace. The pain that was caused to you is just as real, and you have every right to hang on to that. I don't know what's inside of that bag of yours, but you have every right to hang on to that pain. Here's the beautiful thing about it, guys. With Jesus in our life and what God tells us, we also have the very same right to be fully alive, as John 10.10 10 tells us, to be fully alive in Christ. Some of us, some of us, though, would rather fight and stay in the pain than surrender to be healed. Some of us would rather fight to stay in this pain than surrender and be healed. But forgiving, letting God have it, and surrendering brings peace, freedom. So we hang on to this fight. Defeating the wrongdoer becomes our currency. It became mine. I'm sure you can relate to that. We put on our mask that all is good and I've got this covered. Meanwhile, underneath that mask, we're holding on to this anger, resentment, need for a payback. And it even erodes our confidence that Christ's love for us. I was 19 years old. My brother and I uh, left Detroit. We had $330 and a VW bus. Oh, I still miss that VW bus. When we left Detroit, we went to New York, and we ended up in California. We had a dollar a day budget for food, and lodging, a dollar a day. By the time we made it out to California, we had zero left. We found ourselves for the next year living homeless in the streets and beaches of LA for almost a year. Eating out of dumpsters and soup lines. But I got great memories of that guy because it was better than what I had growing up in Detroit from a father that not only was alcoholic, but my father physically abused my three older brothers to the point of almost being unconscious. But it didn't end there. My father sexually abused his own boys. But guys, when a child is raped, it can mess you up. But when you're raped by your own father, you lose all right a sense of what's up and down, what's east and west where protection is, where security is. And every right to hang on to even more. My brothers, my three older brothers all handled it differently. My oldest brother uh, passed away a little less than a year ago. I barely knew him, full of anger. Right to this, right to the end. My next oldest brother, my next oldest brother is currently schizophrenic. I've taken care of him most of my life. He lives in an imaginary world. He's got imaginary friends. But to take his meds takes him back to age 12 for the things that my dad was doing to him. And then my middle brother, my middle brother, the one who led me to the Lord, January 3rd, 1986, called me to say, I love you, Mark. I 
4.30 in the morning. It was really more like, I love you, Mark. I just want to say I'm very sorry for it. We talked for a while. And I hung up the phone. An hour later, the phone rang again. There was somebody to tell me that my brother had started five cars. And he took his life on the phone. Good choice. I was a victim. You were a victim. But guys, let me tell you something. Victims are powerless. Victims have no control on their lives. Victims are at the mercy of others. Victims can only react. Victims are prisoners. Victims have any excuse for any action. I am like this because all things work for good for those who love the Lord. We build an emotional wall around us in the pretense that we're protecting ourselves. In the meanwhile, we only cause more harm because in that wall we're trapped in our anger and our resentment and our need for a payback. And the blame feels as though the rest of the world have got their act together. And why sit on this side of the wall and look over? You got your act together. You got it. You got it. You got it. I'm the one that's hurting and holding on to this. Especially for men. That wall leads to a cycle of either despair or overcompensation. So what is it that Joseph knew when his brother sold him into slavery that we don't know? What is it that Saul knew Excuse me, David knew when Saul was abusing him that we don't know. What is it that Jesus knew that we don't quite get yet? And what is it that I found out why I'm able to stand in front of you right now as a happy, very happy, blessed man and able to talk about this, have a beautiful family and a great life? But friends, this is where... The biggest misconception of forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is just one side of a two-sided transaction. It's one side of a two-sided transaction. Somebody caused harm for me. Somebody stole something from me. Somebody owes me. There needs to be justice. But on the other side is the person that owes me, that I'll never get paid back. What could my dad ever do or say? What apology could he ever do or say? They could ever make up for the things that he did, my brother. It's not subject to paying us back. When you, once you realize that it's only one side of the two-sided transaction, you have the person who's hurt and the person who owes you. It can never be back. It's not subject to an apology. Often they're long gone and out of our lives. This is a debt that won't be paid back, so I can choose to continue to hang on to this debt and be angry. If anybody has ever owed you money, you know exactly what I'm talking about and while they're going on with their life. I can demand that payback. The freedom, though, the release, the forgiveness is only about our side of the <coughs> transaction. It has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the other side. It's not subject to retribution. It's not subject to their understanding the pain that they caused us. It's not subject to an apology. It's not even subject to their being alive. It's subject to nothing. Forgiveness means the subject to not, nothing. Reconciliation is when two sides come together. Reconciliation requires repentance. Again, reconciliation is two sides. Forgiveness is only one side. So what did, let me ask you this. When did Jesus offer his forgiveness? Think about this. When did Jesus offer his forgiveness? It was at the cross. And whom did he offer it to? Everybody. For all men, for all kind, for all time. Subject to 1 John 2.2 2 tells us He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only our sins, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, reconciliation <coughs> with God happens after us as the offender repents and asks for relationship with the person who forgave. So I ask you to write this down. Think about this. Carry it around if you want to for in your, your mind for the next day. But forgiveness will not change the past. But man, that sure will change your future. As long as you feel cheated or owed, the pain remains. But as soon as you become willing to forgive the debt, the healing begins. See, the wound of unforgiveness affects and infects all of your relationships. Again, let me say it again. The wound of unforgiveness, just like we were wounded, but now if I leave that open, like any wound that you have, it causes new problems. It infects with bad relationships, with issues that carry it around. Carrying around this mess gets in the way of my relationships. And what happens with the wound of unforgiveness? Those that are closest to you pay the most. You are uber sensitive to even falsely pursuing sights against you. And you spend your days to prove that you're enough and simply living with nothing to hurt. God, I'm, I'm angry, I'm pissed. How could you do this to me? You promised me that all good things happen for those who love God. I can't let the offender get away with this. And then God said, I didn't promise you that all things would be good. I didn't we read it? I promised that all things would work for those who love God. I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. His children bring their broken toys and tears for us to mend. But instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last I grabbed them back and cried, oh, could you be so slow? And God replied, what could I do? You never did let go. Oh, my God. Did you grasp that? Of the new optics of forgiveness. That I don't have to carry around this pain, shame, and blame. I don't have to wait for an apology. I don't have to wait for anything. For what they do. But only if they, if they, if only they. <clears throat> my goal is not forgiveness. My goal is freedom. The freedom is found in forgiveness, and it is subject to nothing. Martin Luther King said this, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. Think about those relationships that you have, that anger, that's holding up inside you when somebody cuts you off inside of the road, of, of the road. Think of the effect that this has on those that love the most and connect those dots. Because he goes on to say is, there is some good in the worst of us and there's some evil in the best of us. And when we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. And regarding justice, for those, all the believers in the room, think about it. God said up there and says, I saw that. I got this. It's so not your job. Hebrews 10.30 says, God said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. And again in Romans 12.19, do not take revenge, my dear friends. Believe room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay. And personally, the one I really like even better yet 
is all of you be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because in this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Guys, I'm sitting here telling you that I have inherited the blessing. I think I see things that you guys don't see. I think I smell things, hear things that you guys don't experience. Why? Because I've been able to inherit and inherit and experience and have a blessing. Because of what I went through, I can, I can feel as though I am greater blessed than anybody else in the room. And there's not enough hours in this day or days left in my life that I can pay back to Jesus and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. How great it made it, mighty God, because you know what? All things do work for good for those who love God. It just took me a while to understand. So this forgiveness, this forgiveness is subject to nothing. Regardless, regardless of what your story may be, this kind of peace, freedom, and relief <coughs> that you can experience, Joseph, that Joseph experienced, that David experienced, that Jesus experienced in us, that I got to experience. So before we go off the tables, I want you to really think about this, guys. What would be different in your marriage in your relationship with your kids, your relationship with at work, with your dad, with your son, with the Lord. If you can con concept, get a concept in connection, what forgiveness is really all about, that is subject to nothing. God tells us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, here it gives it away to you. Just as if Christ God forgave you. Oh, we'd love to see the Lord's Prayer forgive us and forgive us. We love to downplay when other people, and when I've heard other people, we jump it up a little bit. It wasn't that bad. But they hurt me and then let that burn. And sometimes when you guys, when you go to forgive somebody who's really done something really bad, and they seem in the process where you're forgiving it, like you're taking 39 lashes. Well, I'm doing the forgiving, I'm going through all the pain. Sound familiar? So this works. My dad. Forgive him, Lord, for he knows not what he does. And thank you, Lord, and my dad, that I can find freedom. Freedom. Found in forgiveness. Table leaders take it over, and I'll wrap it up with you.